its nuclear program. This now is the eighth round of sanctions. The U.S. Uh, U.N. ambassador said that with previous resolutions, uh, North Korea exports are now curtailed some 90 percent. She said this uh, resolution would not have passed if not for the close relationship between President Trump and the Chinese president. She also said the U.S. is not looking for war. Here's more of what the uh, U.S. U.N. ambassador had to say. Today we are saying the world will never accept a nuclear armed North Korea. And today, the Security Council is saying that if the North Korean regime does not halt its nuclear program, we will act to stop it ourselves. Now, this resolution is a significantly watered-down version of an earlier draft. That draft called for freezing the assets and a travel ban on Kim Jong-un. It also called for halting all oil sales to North Korea. That is now out. The new version restricts how much refined oil and crude that member states can sell to North Korea. The resolution also targets Pyongyang's pocketbook, halting the uh, export of all textiles. This weekend, Kim Jong-un held a banquet to honor those who helped make his country a nuclear power. And today, the country's foreign ministry issued a statement lashing out the U at the U.S. for sponsoring the latest resolution, saying in part, and I quote, in case the U.S. eventually does rig up the illegal and unlawful resolution on harsher sanctions, the DPRK, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, shall make absolutely sure that the U.S. pays a due price. South Korea's foreign minister also weighing in today, accusing the North of following a reckless path following the sixth nuclear test blast. Tomorrow, Brett, U.S. Marines are expected to hold a, a joint live fire exercise with uh, South Korean military. Brett, back to you. David Lee Miller, live outside the U.N. David Lee, thank you. U.S. officials saying those sanctions watered down in port, in part to keep China and Russia on board. North Korea, they only capped the North's imports of crude oil at the level of the last 12 months. Oil, of course, is the lifeblood of funding and fueling nuclear weapons. But they do ban imports of all natural gas liquids. North Korea expert Gordon Chang joining us now over the phone, a columnist for The Daily Beast and the author of Nuclear Showdown, North Korea Takes on the World. I was so excited when we had you on the show today, uh, Gordon, because, you know, these are the strongest sanctions we've seen against North Korea yet. But the question is, it's not everything the U.S. wanted. Are they strong enough? I don't think they're strong enough. And the reason is that the uh, Chinese and the Russians want sanctions that are perhaps calibrated to bring the North Koreans to the bargaining table. Well, the North Koreans have made it clear that that's the last thing that they want to do right now because they want to basically develop their nukes and their missiles, and then when they're confident in their arsenal, then they may be willing to talk to us. But we want sanctions to prevent them from getting the resources necessary to develop that arsenal. And so, therefore, these sanctions, although better than the last set, um, are the ninth that we have had from the U.N. since 2006, and clearly they're not working. So, so that's, that's the follow-up question. Do you expect them to be ineffective? Um, is this a, a compromise resolution that really just appeases China and Russia, for instance? Well, absolutely. And we know that because uh, Nikki Haley, our ambassador to the U.N., to her credit, actually released what the U.S. proposal was. And, and what has popped out in Resolution 2375 is much weaker than what the U.S. sought. So these aren't going to do what we want them to do. They will, though, however, um, please China and Russia, which are really trying to protect their client, North Korea. Right. Uh, in Geneva, the North Korean envoy saying North Korea will make the U.S. suffer the greatest pain because of these sanctions. But what do you expect the North Korean response to be? And I ask that in the backdrop of Kim Jong-un, the leader, obviously cares for the survival of his people. And I'd imagine he knows continuing to do this to the international community could mean the obliteration of his nation. Well, certainly. I'm not so sure that the North Korean leadership cares about the North Korean people. What they do care about are a couple things. One of them is the survival of the regime, of course. They want a deterrent. They want to sell this stuff to the Iranians and to others. Mm -hmm. And also, they want to achieve and have to achieve the core, goal, the core goal of the North Korean regime, and that is um, the absorption of South Korea. They want to take over South Korea. And they will use their arsenal to intimidate us once they feel that they are in a position to do so. Ah, so South Korea is the prize here. Gordon Chang, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you. This vote. Hey there, Mike. Well, uh, the unanimous vote uh, that occurred just about a, uh, an hour or so ago does not come entirely as a surprise. While there was a slight chance that Russia and China would veto or abstain from this vote, that was unlikely, given that 
This version of the resolution is a watered-down version from a previous draft that had called for a complete oil embargo and for uh, asset free, an asset freeze and travel ban on the DPRK's leader, Kim Jong-un. But it seems that uh, intense negotiations that have taken place over the past few days have reached some sort of a compromise in a bid by the United States to get Russia and China on board in order for this resolution to pass. And it passed quite unanimously. And let's take a listen to what U.S. Ambassador Nikki Haley and China's Ambassador Liu Chiayi have to say. Today's resolution would not have happened without the strong relationship that has developed between President Trump and Chinese President Xi, and we greatly appreciate both teams working with us. The priority at present is to comprehensively and strictly implement the Secret Council resolutions, and the relevant parties should resume talks and negotiation sooner rather than later. Now, while the sanctions imposed uh, this session has been toned down from the previous version, they are still significant because they are the toughest sanctions, toughest nuclear-related sanctions imposed on DPRK so far. Now, it targets the country's last remaining key exports with a textile ban uh, that accounts for nearly $800 million of revenues each year. It also cuts oil exports to the DPRK at current levels and slashes 55 percent of refined petroleum products. And the whole point here is to strangle the country's ability not just to fund but fuel both its nuclear weapons program as well as its ballistic missile program. Mike? Leiling, what impact is this likely to have, though, on the DPRK since it's uh, repeatedly defied sanctions? That's a very good question, and you have a very valid point. Now, this is the eighth round of sanctions imposed on the DPRK. The previous seven rounds have been violated, and there's uh, no saying whether the DPRK would also violate this round. But bear in mind, though, that the UN doesn't have a lot of options here. There have been talks of three, talk about three options uh, that, are, that are available. The first is sanctions, which threatens uh, to destabilize the country's economy. The second is military intervention, either unilaterally or approved by the Security Council, that runs the risk of a collapse of the government. So the options are limited. Yeah. No. Use its dangerous path. We will continue with further pressure. The choice is theirs. Breaking news, Ambassador to the United Nations Nikki Haley just moments ago. That was after the UN Security Council voted unanimously to impose new sanctions on North Korea. Frank Gaffney has been with us all show. I want to bring in now as well Lieutenant Colonel Michael Waltz, former counterterrorism advisor to Vice President Cheney and a Fox News contributor. Colonel, let me start with you. Uh, sure. Ambassador Haley saying that North Korea has not past the point of no return. I thought that was sort of surprising. Uh, there's six nuclear tests, the most powerful one yet, the development of intercontinental ballistic missiles. I mean, when the heck do they pass the point of no return? Well, Charles, first, good to be on with you again. Um, you know, I don't think the administration has fully worked that out yet. You know, when the, when the North Koreans cross that threshold that we're actually going to try to take that program out or take the leadership out. And what Ambassador Haley is signaling is that there's more to be done from a sanctions standpoint. And I would even argue from a diplomatic standpoint as it, regard, as it comes regarding uh, sanctions and economic pressure. But what I take from this vote today, which was watered down, uh, you know, kept in textiles, but not necessarily oil and gas, is that the Chinese calculus still hasn't changed. They still see regime collapse and uh, in a unified Korea friendly to the West as worse than this this nuclear program, and they still see this as basically a problem for Japan, South Korea, and the United States. And I think until we dial up the pressure enough, um, you know, that we're going to change that Chinese calculus, right. we're going to continue to see more of the same. Frank, you know, I'm reading about the revolutionary fund that's in Swiss bank accounts, perhaps $5 billion. I'm reading about the royal economy that's designed to pump money into the Kim family, perhaps generating over a billion dollars a year. Uh, he's insulated from any sort of economic sanctions anyway. And we've seen in the past where they've allowed their people, millions of North Koreans, to die on the streets from starvation in this quest, this crazy quest for military power. So ultimately, they will cross, it seems to the average person watching this, that point of no return. And when they do, what will the further pressure be? Well, as our friend John Bolton has pointed out, the concern is, of course, that that point of no return is when they've started killing Americans. 
And I think for many of us, that's an unacceptable proposition. And I agree with Michael. I think that the Chinese calculus, as I said earlier in the program, is continuing to be. It's in their interest, actually, mm -hmm. to have the North Koreans threaten us. But, Charles, I would start uh, by taking out the North Korean satellites that are operating as we speak over this earth, including on a regular basis overflying the United States. They are platforms, if so designed and equipped, to unleash an electromagnetic pulse attack against this country that could be absolutely devastating. In fact, nation that, Frank, ending. Frank, that would be a provocative act. Be, what they would consider well, that an act of war, wouldn't they? They might well, and all we need to do is tell them, listen, anything you put up in space is going to be treated in the same way. If you choose to take this step beyond this, then there will be consequences uh, as well for you. But I think the key point here is this is a perfectly legitimate and I think absolutely necessary defensive measure. Right. Uh, Bill Clinton's former director of central intelligence has warned he thinks those satellites may be ready for an EMP attack against us. We can't afford to have that happen. Colonel Waltz, a lot of folks, yeah. though, a lot of observers are saying what Kim is doing, Kim Jong-un, is actually acting rationally. He is seeing what's happened to the Saddam Husseins of the world and others who didn't possess a nuclear weapon. Uh, is there some rationality here? And uh, if, there's, if that is the case, why would he ever give the nukes up? Well, look, I think he's done a great job of dialing up the, you know, uh, his activity and then dialing it back just before we take uh, military action so that he can buy more time and develop his program. And his program is going to get more and more sophisticated as we try to get these economic and diplomatic sanctions in place. But back to the Chinese calculus, which I think is critical, there are things we can still do. We can reintroduce tactical right. nukes, as the South right. Koreans have asked, and we can help the Japanese remilitarize, and that will wake the Chinese yeah. up, it's I about think, to see this more of a problem. Japan junked that uh, post-World War II constitution. I am not Sorry. responsible for this. Peut-être d'abord en français, une fois n'est pas coutume, un mot pour vous dire que dans l'attente de la résolution que j'espère nous pourrons voter ensemble tout à l'heure, je voudrais au nom de la France, ou plutôt tout à l'heure, j'adresserai au nom de la France trois principaux messages politiques sous la forme de trois exigences. La première, c'est l'exigence de lucidité. Euh, la menace nord-coréenne a changé de dimension, euh, voire de nature. De régional, cette menace est devenue mondiale. De virtuelle est devenue immédiate. Euh, de euh, une menace localisée, encore une fois, elle est devenue mondiale. Et euh, d'une menace euh, euh, partielle, elle est devenue une menace qui... Euh, nous oblige tous d'une menace grave à une menace existentielle, comme je l'ai dit. Cette menace euh, nous oblige et nous rassemble. L'ensemble des membres du Conseil de sécurité, nous avons aujourd'hui la même analyse de cette menace et c'est un point essentiel pour nous rassembler. La deuxième exigence, euh, c'est, euh, je dirais, pour faire court et pour ne pas être trop long, une exigence de fermeté. Face à la menace que j'évoquais, le Conseil de sécurité doit réagir de manière ferme et de manière unie, de manière rapide aussi, comme la France l'a appelé à plusieurs reprises. Cette exigence de fermeté, elle s'exprimera, je l'espère, dans le texte de la résolution que nous voterons tout à l'heure. C'est une résolution, cette résolution marque une étape importante et nécessaire dans l'accroissement de cette fermeté, dans l'accroissement des sanctions, l'élargissement aussi des sanctions face à la Corée du Nord, nous le verrons tout à l'heure. Donc exigence de lucidité, exigence de fermeté, exigence aussi de diplomatie, à laquelle la fermeté que j'évoquais euh, doit conduire. Euh, il faut être conscient, et je crois que nous le sommes tous autour de la table, que la fermeté maximale aujourd'hui, sous la forme d'un renforcement des sanctions, est notre meilleur levier pour promouvoir un règlement politique demain, et c'est aussi notre meilleur antidote face au risque de confrontation. C'est donc avec ces trois messages principaux que je m'adresserai tout à l'heure au, au Conseil de sécurité. Now a few words in English. Uh, so I, I, I was saying in, in French that I had three uh, political messages that I will pass on uh, my colleagues of the Security Council later this evening. First of all, the bottom line of our action is simple. The threat of the nuclear and ballistic program of North Korea has changed in scope, uh, in scale, and actually in its very nature. 
we're facing not a regional, but a global threat, not a virtual, but an immediate threat, not a serious, but an existential threat. This threat is what unites us in the Security Council, and I hope what will bring us towards unity when it comes to the vote, but also to the after steps uh, of the vote. Number two, we fully support the resolution proposed by the United States. We think this is a robust uh, resolution. We think it is a needed and important step towards the firmness that I was just referring to. We'll speak about it a bit later in the day. Uh, and number three, our deep belief is that only a firm reaction of the Council can open the path towards a political solution to this crisis. Make no mistake about it, our firmness today is our best antidote to the risk of war, to the risk of confrontation, and our firmness today is our best tool for a political solution tomorrow. Ambassador, you... has the resolution been watered down enough to win the support of Russia and China? I think the conditions are met to go for a vote. We, France, have totally supported uh, the effort. We completely support the text of the resolution as it is. By definition, this is a compromise uh, in order to get everybody on board. This is the condition of the firmness that I was referring to. Again, we believe we have a strong, robust resolution, uh, and we believe this resolution is a needed uh, and important step uh, with respect to the firmness I was referring to, a firmness that is the condition for a political solution tomorrow. Does that mean that you're expecting a unanimous vote on this resolution? You should ask my, my colleagues, but, the, but France... We've been in negotiations. We have France is fully on board, and uh, I hope there will be a good vote later today. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Than the draft that was circulated by the United States. The original draft of the resolution that the U.S. circulated had actually called for a full oil and natural gas embargo against the DPRK, forbidding North Korea from importing any oil or natural gas. Well, the resolution that just passed is far different. It simply caps the amount of oil and natural gas that North Korea can import. Now, the original draft uh, that was being circulated furthermore called for a freezing of the assets of Kim Jong-un and a travel ban on North Korea's leader, forbidding him from leaving North Korea. Uh, that was not included in the resolution that just passed. Now, immediately after it was unanimously passed by the 15 members of the UN Security Council, we heard from Nikki Haley, the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. This is what she said in the chambers. We are not looking for war. The North Korean regime has not yet passed the point of no return. If it agrees to stop its nuclear program, it can reclaim its future. If it proves it can live in peace, the world will live in peace with it. Time is short. I think enough is enough. Action is required. The United States is prepared to use the full range of our capabilities to defend ourselves and our allies. Now that's quite a change in tone. We've heard Nikki Haley speaking at the UN Security Council about North Korea, and she has not been so calm in recent weeks. This is what she had to say. Time is short. I think enough is enough. Action is required. The United States is prepared to use the full range of our capabilities to defend ourselves and our allies. Now, we also heard from the representative of the Russian Federation. Now, the ambassador for the Russian Federation, he talked about how Russia's opinion and Russia's perspective has been, and Russia maintains, that it is not acceptable for North Korea to have nuclear weapons. Furthermore, he went on to emphasize the proposal, the double freeze proposal put forward by the United, uh, by the double freeze proposal put forward by Russia and China, calling for a freeze in provocative military drills in the South and in exchange for a freeze in nuclear proliferation and provocative activities from the North. Uh, this is the ambassador of the Russian Federation speaking before the UN Security Council. It's a big mistake to underestimate this Russian-Chinese initiative. It remains on the table at the Security Council, and we will insist on it being considered. Now, the resolution that was just passed emphasized a call for the six-party talks to resume. 
From day one, Russia and China have called for negotiations and a diplomatic solution to the crisis and an easing of tensions on the Korean Peninsula. And it seems that that view put forward by Russia and China from the beginning of this crisis has prevailed with the resolution being passed by the 15-member body, the UN Security Council. All right, RT's Caleb Moppin for us there. We know this is a developing story. Uh, we're sure to get reaction from North Korea, and we'll be with you once we do get that. Thanks for being with us here on RT International. Uh, now, about that reaction earlier, the North Korean leader uh, did warn Washington that it would pay a price if the resolution was passed uh, by the Security Council. Take a listen. The forthcoming measures to be taken by the DPRK will cause the U.S. the greatest pain and suffering it has ever gone through in its entire history. Right, now let's discuss this further live with Richard Becker from the Answer Coalition. Uh, Richard, you're always someone who I want to get your perspective when big things like this are happening out there in the world. Um, we have seen an incredibly different resolution go to the Security Council than that original draft that we saw from the United States. Why do you think that the U.S. watered this down so much? Well, I think that they wanted some action to be taken, and they knew that uh, China and I believe also Russia would not go along with what the, that draft was. That was uh, really a, a recipe for extinction for uh, North Korea to cut off all natural gas and oil shipments would, would really endanger uh, their existence. Uh, but I think that we have to keep in mind that just six days ago, uh, the same U.S. ambassador to the U.N., Nikki Haley, even after the International Atomic Energy Association certified that Iran was carrying out all of the conditions of the uh, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action that was passed in 2015, that was ratified in 2015 by the uh, P5 plus one and Iran, uh, that she was still threatening and President Trump was threatening to abrogate the agreement, in other, in other words, to uh, unilaterally withdraw from it. And we remember that in 2002, President Bush at that time called Iran, Iraq, and North Korea the axis of evil. Iraq was destroyed the following year. Uh, it was torn apart. Uh, and Iran was, has been threatened. And now we see that even when an agreement was made between the U.S. and its allies in Iran, that there's been a, a withdrawal from it. So what lesson is North Korea, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, supposed to draw from uh, what the United States has been do saying and doing? So, uh, Richard, on some levels, Common sense seems to be lost, if that makes any sense. I mean, uh, Russia and China have proposed that North Korea freeze nuclear and ballistic missile tests. That seems to make sense. While the United States and South Korea will stop their military drills, something that has been a thorn in the DPRK's side forever, it seems. Uh, why do you think that uh, the U.S. and South Korea won't agree to such a proposal? And why do you think North Korea won't stop with their program? <laughs> Well, I think that for anyone who has an objective view of this situation, they know that regardless of what rhetoric is used, that North Korea is, has developed nuclear weapons and a missile capa uh, capability as a deterrent. They know that if they were to launch first, uh, which they're not about to do, that, that they w would really suffer incredible uh, damage, if not complete, uh, being completely wiped out. So they're doing it as a deterrent. The United States could stop these maneuvers, and South Korea could stop the maneuvers, and our decapitation, they talk about them as being a plan for decapitation and the invasion and occupation of the North. They're extremely menacing, and you never know, uh, the other side never knows when those maneuvers are going on so close to their border, whether they are maneuvers or they're, in fact, the real thing. Uh, North Korea has also said that if there's a peace treaty signed between the, uh, them and the United States, and there's a halt to those maneuvers that they would suspend uh, nuclear and, and missile tests. But the United States has brushed this off as absolutely uh, unthinkable. And so I think that's the real reason that we have an ongoing crisis. Now, we have seen uh, past experience of famine and uh, the actual evidence of what sanctions do to the people of the DPRK, uh, the famous famine in the 1990s. Uh, in regards to this, um, Vladimir Putin has said that sanctions really won't make a difference 
because the North Korean regime is set on acquiring nuclear weapons. We know that they already have them. Uh, we also know that they're willing to throw their people under the bus in order to pursue their own goals. Do you think that these sanctions will actually mean anything uh, for the country or do any good? Well, I doubt it very much. Uh, I, I think that continuing to provoke and take hostile action against North Korea uh, by the United States is just leading us closer and closer to uh, what could become a military confrontation. Uh, South Korea certainly doesn't want that. The people of South Korea, the people of North Korea, and I believe the people of the United States have no appetite for yet another war. But to continue to take hostile actions and to reject altogether uh, uh, negotiations, although some in the United States, U.S. administration, the Trump administration, have expressed uh, uh, their view that there needs to be negotiations, but still Trump and his top advisors are precluding this. And you know, it's a very dangerous situation. Uh, the escalation ladder can be unintentionally climbed uh, to uh, war. And so that's what makes it so hazardous. All right, very interesting to hear your thoughts.